Good afternoon. Welcome to a time of celebration and remembrance. Um, on behalf of the family, I am Zachary Kittner, the pastor of Sherman Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you've joined us today uh, to celebrate the life of an amazing uh, wife, mother, um, sister, friend. Uh, we pray that you would be touched by the Spirit of God as we come together, as we celebrate uh, an incredible life. Let's bow our, our heads together. So Lord, as we come today to celebrate Janice and the wonderful impact that she has had, the ways that we encountered you through her, we bring hearts of gratitude and thankfulness. And God, we come to celebrate something, uh, the greatest reality that any life can have, which is life through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Lord, we ask you to be at work in this time. Help us to see what that means, to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, to have the, the truth and the promises that only are available through him. And God, as we celebrate a truly wonderful, loving, extraordinary woman, we are grateful that you meet us in this time. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would minister, that you would bring laughter and joy as we reflect, as we celebrate, as we share, and as we lift our praise and our worship to you, grateful for all that you have done in Janice's life. We pray these things in your most holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. One of the great things we get to do is uh, share memories, those things that were special and important to us, and then celebrate so I'm going to have a few words um, up here. I have to ask Kieran to come up first for us. Come up first? No? Not yet. Okay. How about Jill? Jill, why don't you come up here? Oh, Jill, come up. Pull that off to the side. I'll have you hold this. It's easier that way. You're welcome. Fifty years, and probably I was thinking about it today. I think it's probably been sixty years. We went to music camp together, and we played in piano recitals right here in this church. We'd sit back there in that back room and wait to go out on the stage, and I would be biting my fingernails and nervous, and she'd be so calm and cool. She really had everything under control. We went to music camp to Canada together, and we traveled from L.A. to Toronto on a train. I was 15 years old, and I think the reason my mom let me go was because Janice was going too. She knew she was level-headed, and she knew she'd be calm and organized and watch out for me. I was honored to be in her wedding. Later, when she moved to Irvine, we didn't see each other as often, but we always kept in touch through Christmas cards and phone calls. She was busy with her family and I with mine. As the kids got older, it was easier to get together. And I remember the day she called me to say she was going to be a grandmother. She was so thrilled and excited. That was as happy as I've ever heard her. Over the years, we would get together and share stories of kids and work and grandchildren. She was the best storyteller. She, her memory was amazing. She could remember places and people and names, things that I could never remember. And when she set out to do something, she did it. I remember one time she called me up and she said, come up and help me hang up this shelf. I want to put this shelf in my living room. I said, sure, I'll help you. Well, when I got there, she had everything ready, including a large ladder. This shelf was to be hung nine feet off the ground. She had the directions, and they weren't even in English. They were just numbers and arrows and pictures, and she actually understood them. We got that shelf put up, and we're quite proud of ourselves. After we finished patting ourselves on the back, we went out and had ice cream, like we always did. She was a good friend. I could tell her anything. She never judged me, criticized me, and I can honestly say in all the years I knew her, we never had a harsh word or an argument. To find one real friend in a lifetime is good fortune. To keep that friend is a blessing. I consider myself blessed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Ooh. 
Hello. <laughs> well, this is not going to be easy, so I'm going to try and get through this. My friend Janice, what do you say at a time like this? Janice was one of two people that I have known during my lifetime that I can honestly say did not have a mean bone in her makeup. She was always there for a friend and for her family. Janice, Ruth, and myself all lived on a small cul-de-sac street in the valley. We gave new meaning to the word gang. Janice moved in first, then came me, and then Ruth. Our kids all became like an extended family. We all just seemed to click. Though we were all very different in many ways, it just worked. I learned so much about being a parent from Janice. She had so many awesome traditions with her kids, Wendy and Amy. One of those traditions was to acknowledge the half birthday. This meant on your half birthday, you would get to choose a home-baked item, chocolate chip cookies, cake, brownies, etc. I thought, what a cool idea. I'm going to do that too. The tradition lives on in my granddaughter, Taylor, now. Reminds me, her half birthday is coming. She is 12 and a half, and last month was her half birthday. She said, Grandma, are we going to make our usual for my half birthday? My half birthday is coming. I said, Taylor, do we really have to do that this year? She said, Grandma, it's tradition. It's true. Thank you, Janice, for all the love, friendship, and wonderful memories. You will live in, in my heart forever. Thank you. Uh, well. <laughs> I, um, I'm Kieran, her grandson. Um, I've known her since I was as young as I was born, obviously. Um, I spent a lot of time with her at her apartment, with her at her garden, and at Balboa. We spent a lot of time together planting her carrots and all her other vegetables. Whenever we were done with our little days after preschool, we would go out to Balboa Island. We'd go get some ice cream, even though I didn't like ice cream. And then after, we'd go to Wiener Schnitzel and get our favorite hot dogs. After we got our favorite hot dogs, we, got, we went back to our apartment, and we always went back and got more hot dogs. <laughs> My Nana was everything to me. When I found out she got cancer, I had a ton of opportunities to go see her. But I chose not to because I was afraid. Afraid to see her. I don't know. I don't want to get to see her again. Last couple months, she came up and I was able to see my last couple of basketball games at my high school. Those last basketball games meant everything to me. Knowing that in the next month when she passed, all I can remember now is those last basketball games. Since my name was brought up, I uh, think I should stand up and uh, <laughs> say, uh, represent the other part of the triumvirate, Janice, Sandy, and Ruth. But first, Kieran, you are a wonderful young man. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot to stand up here right now and say those things about your grandma. I know when my grandma died, I was a basket case. I couldn't have stood up if I wanted to, so you, you bested me, kiddo. Good job. You know, when you uproot yourself, and you go from the East Coast to the West Coast, it's a big jump all at once. And I made a big jump with my son Chad and my husband, a cat and a dog, and somehow we went from New York to Van Nuys in one fell swoop, and I arrived with no furniture 
and a big empty house. And the furniture was supposed to arrive a week before we did, but it never came. And I remember vividly a on the door, and I am standing there with a half-drugged cat and dog because we had just gotten off the plane and I had tranquilized a mold. <laughs> and a, a three-year-old kid standing there looking very, where are we, mom? And there was this marvelous woman and she had a plate of brownies in her hand and she said, hi, my name is Denise, I live across the street. Would you like some brownies and can I help? You know, and that was the cornerstone of every single thing that Janice did was, can I help? And help she did. That first couple of nights before the furniture arrived, we had mattresses. We needed those, otherwise the floor was going to be a little hard. <laughs> she had a daughter who was my son's age. Now, Janice, when she knocked on the door, had button here on her hip. Okay, but Button was not very communicative in those days. She just looked at you. But Button was on her hip. Wendy, on the other hand, was hyperactive. All around the room, immediately spotted this one back here, Chad. And the next thing you know, they were off getting a sugar high in the corner with the brownies. And Denise was calmly telling me where the grocery store was, where, where the doctor was, would I like to go out for Mexican food. And of course, I made the mistake of saying, what's Mexican food? Excuse me, I've been brought up in Long Island. <laughs> Puerto Rican food hadn't even come in then. Denise took me out that day for lunch. She had to explain to me what a taco was, what a burrito was, and what a taco salad was. And an enchilada, that was what it was. I couldn't pronounce that. What's an enchichicha? Denise and Sandy and I shared three wonderful kids together and Button. Button wasn't walking then, but the rule was that the kids couldn't cross the street. All right, we lived on a cul-de-sac. So it was Janice who plotted out how they would get to each other's house. You may stay on the sidewalk and you may go to each person's house via the sidewalk. Now mind you, I lived directly across the street from Janice and Sandy was at the end of the cul-de-sac. For Wendy to come up and over and play with Chad, Wendy had to walk all the way up the street, all the way around, and all the way back down, and vice versa. They weren't, they weren't even, it took them until second grade to figure out that they could just walk across the street. But that was Janice, always plotting and planning. She will be very missed. We missed our coffee cups together. Sandy, Janice, and I, we, we had a lot of those. It was one of those marvelous times where you bond over kids, the jobs you have to do at the present time. And for some reason, that, that stayed long after we, could, we were in, in direct contact with one another. Yes, that was a friendship I, I treasured always. It's as fresh to me today as it was back then. So Janice, well, you know what? The other thing that Janice did was, because I had to work, she found me a nursery school for Chad, because I needed, guess where it was? Right here. <laughs> At you too? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Janice's spirit lives on in this, in this church in many ways. It's kind of a comfort to have it here. And thank you both, knowing that she had already moved to North to bringing her home here with us. That's the important thing. She's home now. Thank you. Tough to do. Tough for me now. But the moments that I had with my godmother, I knew that she took that vow seriously. If anything happened to my parents, I know she would have been there for me. She let me drive her car too fast. It was a turbocharged little Volvo. She never complained. <laughs> she took me to a couple of football games. You look back on those things. and She even gave me some of my games. So uh, I'll be brief. I love Janice, and 
everybody here, and thank you for well, coming. I'm another Ruth in Janice's life, um, and I'm just here representing her work life. Um, everybody's talked about wonderful memories. Um, there's a few of us here representing, unfortunately, um, there was another funeral for everybody to attend as well at the exact same time. So there's a past principal of hers, there's those of us in special education, and um, we had a different coffee circle with her. Ours was around the table um, with parents and other special educators, and in the later years, attorneys, <laughs> because special ed got a little bit, a little bit rough. But um, she always put kids first um, in her in her job, and so there's a number of us here, and we just wanted you to know that it would be um, bigger in numbers had the circumstances been different, and she was very loved and very missed. Our scripture is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, um, verses 1 through 8. Paul writes these words for us. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Zach, I thank you for the invitation and family, the invitation to participate in this service, a witness to the resurrection and celebration of the life. Janice Geringer Therrell. Almost eight years ago, we uh, gathered here for a service for Ida Geringer. And we're in shock and in grief to be coming together again for our service today. But I want to say that of even greater importance, the greatest importance, is that just three weeks ago we celebrated the most tremendous and significant event in all of human history. The fact that Jesus Christ that though he died, yet was raised from the dead and promises to you and to me resurrection. We affirm resurrection, promise, and power in all the great historic creeds of the church, like the Apostles' Creed that we said together near the beginning of the service. But for a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to return with me to some ancient history in this church in the 1970s when I was pastor. I told Jason, I said, I was pastor here before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we started using the uh, brief affirmation of, of faith which the Presbyterian Church published in 1970 in their worship book or in our worship book services. And we're going to recite it together after this message, but with an important addition. We've edited it just a little bit to include some who were overlooked. That 1970 statement echoes Paul's summary 
which Zach just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the apostle declares, I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and so forth. Who did the resurrected Christ first appear to? Paul says, Peter. Well, someone's missing. Um, it was, remember, a patriarchal society where the witness of women just didn't count. It was the men, just the men. But you read the gospel accounts, and it's very clear all through the gospels that Jesus elevated the place of women in um, the family of God and in society. To be fair to Paul, one of the most significant Christ-like statements that, that he wrote appears in Galatians uh, chapter 3, where he says, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, there is no longer slave nor free, there is no longer male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Good for you, Paul. But when I think of that um, great lady and elder in this church, Ida Geringer, I immediately think of her daughter, Janice, cut out of the same piece of cloth. What a heritage these daughters of Janice have. Um, out of the same piece of cloth, Janice, Geringer, Therrell, two godly women who were strong, courageous, and committed disciples of Jesus Christ, women whom I admired greatly. Um, tragically, Ida's husband Clifford died when, of a heart attack in 1950 when Janice was only five years old. What a loss. Both of them shared that loss, and they faced it, and they grew stronger together. Ida sold their house on Long Island and immediately, clear across the country, bought a large vacant lot here in Sherman Oaks on Dickens where she built her apartment house. And um, that's where Janice grew up. That apartment house was completed and they moved in in 1952, one year to the day that they had left their home in New York. What an accomplishment. And they knew that God's hand had been in this in an amazing way. They looked for a new church home and eventually found their place here. This one, where they not only um, continued to be nurtured in faith, but made their own unique contribution to the life and work and worship and witness of this congregation. But back to those Gospels with their accounts of women who encountered the very Son of God. Early in our Lord's earthly ministry, you'll remember the time that he traveled through Samaria at a time when the Samaritans were very much despised by the Jewish people. A Jewish man would never condescend to talk even to a Samaritan man, much less to a Samaritan woman. But we remember the woman who had come to draw water at the town well. And it just happened that Jesus was there. And he said the unthinkable. He spoke to her, and then he said, give me a drink. 
the, the rest of the disciples were absolutely dumbfounded. They were astonished that Jesus would even talk with her, much less ask a favor. But from the conversation that ensued, that woman's life was changed for eternity, and she went running back into the city telling everyone that she had met the, the, uh, the Messiah. And we read in the scriptures, many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. What an amazing story. What an amazing, loving Lord. Later, we remember the story of Jesus' friend Lazarus in Bethany and Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha. Lazarus died. He'd already been in the tomb four days, and they summoned Jesus, who had delayed coming. He wanted everybody to know for sure that Lazarus was dead when he arrived. So Jesus arrives, and Martha ran up to him. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on that last day. And it was to a woman, to Martha, that Jesus spoke these memorable words that give us the assurance that we need today when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So in those powerful words ever spoken on the face of this earth, One more story, John chapter 20. Jesus had been crucified. He was buried on that Good Friday, that first Good Friday. And now it was early Sunday morning and still dark, and Mary Magdalene and other women came to the tomb, and they saw that it was empty. And so they ran back and, and told the disciples. And two of the disciples, Peter and John, rushed to the tomb to see for themselves if it was really empty. They peered inside, and they saw collapsed grave clothes as if the body that had been wrapped in them had just suddenly disappeared. They returned home, but Mary stayed. She was by the tomb weeping, weeping. Two angels appeared, spoke to her from inside the tomb. With tears, she said, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And then she turned around, and in the dimness of that early dawn, she saw a man standing there who turned out, of course, to be Jesus, who said, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And from the sound of his voice, she knew immediately who it was. The first person the risen Christ appeared to was a woman, Mary Magdalene, who rushed back to tell the disciples what she had seen and what he had said to her, and it was to the other women who had heard the angels as they declared, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. These women were the first witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. 
Christians call the assurance of life after death the Christian hope. And from our modern use of the word hope, we might think that just means wishful thinking. No. The meaning of, of that word from the very beginning is assurance. Christian assurance. The bodily resurrection of Christ, remember, is the only possible event that could account for the way first century Christianity spread like wildfire across the empire and gave those who knew him such confidence and courage that they were willing to die for what they believed. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, why are we putting ourselves in danger every hour? In other words, to accept Christian baptism meant a willingness in those days to die for your faith. Just as in many parts of the world today, perhaps as we have not seen for a long, long time, Christians are being slaughtered for what they believe. But our future, Paul was saying, with the risen Christ makes it all worthwhile. Death is real, and to lose a loved one much too soon is tragic. Those who are left behind experience deep grief, but we have the promise and the power of resurrection and can begin to think of death not as the end, but as the beginning of a life that is even more abundant. We often think of losing when we should also think of gain. We think of parting when we should also think of arrival. There has been a great reunion in heaven when Janice Therrell arrived there, I promise you. And we too can have that experience someday and, and even more as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. One last thing I'd like to share with you. When Polly's older sister, Gloria, died much too young and from cancer, Polly, wife Polly, poured her heart out to the Lord and she asked for some words of comfort. And she seemed drawn to a scripture she had never seen before. And it was 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, in the Bible, the version that she was reading, it's called the Living Bible. Here it is. After you have suffered for a little while, our God, who is full of kindness through Christ, will give you his eternal glory. He personally will come and pick you up and set you firmly in place and make you stronger than ever. Janice, Geringer, Farrell, stronger than ever. Stronger than ever. Thank you, God. Taking to heart these words of comfort and assurance, let me ask you if you will stand and join in that affirmation of faith and then remain standing for the hymn that we will sing together. And uh, this is that affirmation I told you was from the 1970 version, but there's just a little addition. This is the good news. Please read with me. This is the good news which we receive, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared 
first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and to many faithful witnesses. We believe he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. is over I fly away to that home on God's celestial shore I fly away I fly away on oh glory I fly away in the morning when I die hallelujah by Of this life have gone, I fly away like a bird from these prison walls. I've flown, I fly away, I fly away. Oh, glory! I fly away in the morning when I die. Bye. I fly away I 